But I think that what you're going to find is, and that's where we are now, really, there's a war for talent. If you want to get top talent, you need to be able to recruit people. And that means meeting their needs. And people have realized the value of having some personal time, having some flexibility to meet needs. We're also realizing the value of having diverse individuals at work. And that means that not everyone's lifestyles are built in such a way that I can go work from eight to five, Monday through Friday. As more companies demand that employees return to the office, is the work from home era coming to an end? Welcome to the search bar. You've got questions, let's find some answers. I'm your host, Adam Sparks. And today we're chatting with Misty Bennett, Associate Dean of the College of Business and Administration at Central Michigan University. Welcome, Misty. I'm excited to have you here in person so we can talk about being remote. We are both living in a world right now where we probably couldn't have done this two and a half years ago because we all were living through a pandemic and we probably weren't vaccinated two and a half, three years ago. Everyone who has a job that was able to be remote at that time was probably remote for at least a few months. The result of that has been that the kind of the way that we work has changed pretty dramatically or maybe not as dramatically as we first thought it would. And I'm just curious kind of what your take is on the state of remote work right now. Like, how do you see it currently as we sit? What does the world look like for those of us who may or may not commute with a webcam? Yeah, so it's interesting. We all, I think, got more experience working remotely than we thought we would have. And I think at the start of the pandemic, there was a great disruption. But then the idea that this would be a very short lived thing and mm -hmm. we're going to go weeks. back to normal and all's going to be, you know, it's all going to be the same. So this is just a temporary thing. And then we saw companies like Google saying, well, we're going to bring folks back. Oh, wait, no, we're not. <laughs> it, it's going to get delayed another three months and another six months. And and so at each of those points was this lingering question for employees, I think. Uh, for those who are able, and I think it's important that we reference that, right? Yeah. There are still jobs, and my husband's one of them. He's an optometrist. Yeah. He has to see your eyeballs in person to be able to do his job. Um, so not all jobs can be done remotely, but I, I think that we certainly broadened and tested that a bit and expanded to have more jobs being done remote than we ever thought we would, mm -hmm. and for longer than we ever thought we would. And so now companies are in this place, and I think workers are in this place of, is this the new normal? And are we always going to be able to be remote? And I think the really important thing for companies is what are, you know, what's the cost of that? And mm -hmm. so obviously there are physical costs. There's resources that, you know, you have to designate to remote workers. There are resource savings by not having expensive offices in urban locations. There are also, however, there are people costs involved. And so one of the things that I've noticed recently working with companies is, uh, you know, I ask, they, they'll ask me to come in and say, you know, can you talk to our employees about engagement and get them engaged and get them, you know, to, to come back to work because we want them back. Right. And uh, sometimes that conversation evolves and, and I'll ask more probing questions and, well, what are your employees reasons for wanting to stay home? Right. And so sometimes there are some very serious, you know, maybe there's caregiving reasons involved. Maybe there's a personal health reason involved. So, you know, for instance, an individual with fibromyalgia might be better served working from home. It might be more productive. <clears throat> but the, I think the challenge is making sure that those people still feel engaged, still feel like they're committed to the company, a part of the team. From the company's perspective, I think there's a concern that we're kind of losing that culture that mm -hmm. we had when we were all together. Yeah, there's. Oh, wow. There's so much things that can be unpacked, right? I want to start with efficiency. I'll put my personal bias on it. I think some in most places where efficiency isn't isn't very easily measured by metrics, if your job isn't outputting numbers, right? A call center is a place to easily measure efficiency. But a lot of us, if we work in creative and business endeavors or project management endeavors, managing our efficiency or monitoring our efficiency is is a very difficult task. And it seems like that is all, probably a compounded challenge for remote work. What's your take on that? Yeah, it, so, so many things, so many directions I can go in with that. Mm -hmm. One of the pieces that has happened as a result of the pandemic is some companies, and, and this is just partly a management style. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
some companies are very top down and don't necessarily trust their workers, right? And so we're going to monitor your productivity. So insert webcams and keyboard trackers and all of the things. So mm-hmm. people were doing some some creative, we'll say, uh, tricks and workarounds to uh, having, you know, a cat walk across a keyboard while they're taking a break to go do something. Mm-hmm. Or people cheat all the time with the health trackers, with putting their their Fitbit on the dog to get the, the you know, the steps and the points. So people are really good at working around systems. Oh, for sure. And it never feels good from the employee perspective to be watched right. and to be distrusted, essentially. You know, you're essentially saying, we don't trust that you're doing your job at home, so we're going to watch you closely. What we've learned and what we've known from organizational behavior or literature, we've been doing studies since the 80s on telework. Mm-hmm. And telework, interestingly, really started telecommuting as a government initiative to save money. And uh, what we found, the, the manager's assumption always is that, well, I'm not going to trust them. Uh, you're, you're wearing a Meowster Chief pin. And we were mm-hmm. having this conversation earlier, so I have to bring it up, right? But you're going to be sitting at home playing Halo instead of working. I will. So <laughs> how are we going <laughs> to trust you, right? We've got to watch. We've got to monitor. So, you know, that's, that's the question. But when they started to study, well, are you really playing Halo? Or are you mm-hmm. actually going to be worked on? productivity was skyrocketing. People were more productive at home. They were more efficient at home. They were reporting that they had more time, more, you know, work-life balance, all of the things. So uh, I think it really kind of changed the expectations that we weren't seeing what managers were fearing, that people really were, for the most part, more productive. There seems like there's this, uh, not that anyone here has done this to me in a way that's tangible. It feels like when it comes to like workplace productivity or the way we're going to shift the way we work, the, the tendency is to qualify whether something's going to be effective by how it's worked in the past, right? That's the only thing you really know. So I, it, it, if you're somebody who did remote work during the pandemic and you're being asked to come in, it, it might feel kind of regressive at this point. But also, I mean, it, I think it's tough for these, and it's, I don't think it's any one individual, but like kind of like management, I'm saying that in, as kind of like a monolith to not just go, well, we felt more comfortable doing this other thing that we did for 30 years. I think it is sort of a natural reaction, but I would postulate, and I'm betting you'll agree, at least with me to some degree on this, that the cat's out of the bag. I don't think that white collar workers are going to go back to anything that looked like pre-pandemic anytime soon. Right. And also because they have the power right now just in numbers right mm-hmm. so you know there's a war for talent and especially in certain areas so you know people can dictate their terms of if i want to work from home and i'm a skilled worker with a unique skill set i get to do that so i think companies are having a little bit of a rude awakening in that they thought we'd be able to say hey you guys come back now it's time you know pandemic's over it's time to come back everybody and people said no we're good like we realized all of these, you know, benefits. And, and I think that people are really starting to redefine what work looks like. And when we talk about work-life balance and having boundaries between work and home, mm-hmm. you know, I think that, I mean, it looks different for every individual, but I think that in general, people are we're on the, evolving on this journey that, you know, it has changed. And so dictating the terms and saying you're coming back is not going to work. And, and I've seen it really fail and, and companies will lose some of their top talent because of it. I think if they want to do it, then companies, and there certainly are benefits to doing it, right? It, there are a lot of benefits. We do still have better collaboration when we're in person. Right? Right. We do see stronger commitment and loyalty when we're in person, but companies have to make that case again. And so they have to convince people, this is why it's better for you to come back, right? Because you can be a part of these things, this team, this initiative. And so I think that's the the journey that companies are on right now is figuring out how to do that and how to get that message across. Probably the thesis, right? If this were, if we were giving a course packet out to students right now, right? It's where we work and talk about it in those terms. You know, kind of the, the beginning of this lecture would be, we're probably going to a hybrid workplace largely. Again, I'm talking about white collar work, yeah. flexible schedule, not, not you're only working three days, but like you're, yeah, you know, you're not working in the office like Monday and Friday. Like, right. So. Yeah. And, and I think that the challenge is always, if I'm a part of a team, 
and my days are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and your mm -hmm. days are Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, then we're not going to have that opportunity for collaboration. And so that's when companies have to be really intentional about how they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have seen some companies say, you know, it's 40% of your week is in person and we're all here Monday, Tuesday. Those, right. are, the, those are the collaboration days. So I think if you have teams where in-person collaboration is still important, then, you know, absolutely, you need to have those conversations. But I, I think that they're recognizing that, again, white collar types of jobs, there's this great latitude of, you know, how things are going to get accomplished. And at the end of the day, if someone is accomplishing their work, they're productive, meeting all the targets, and they feel like they have better work-life balance, then that's a win. There could be also, there's a cost benefit to these at least part-time remote positions, right? Because people seem to prefer them. That seems like when you do this, and even before the pandemic, I think like the, when you, you pulled the work floor, so like, yeah, baby, I want to work three days a week or four days a week, you know, in the office again, not, not talking about going four day work week, different podcast. People seem to prefer that. And in terms of turnover and having that flexibility, that's what makes a job attractive. It's expensive to hire new people. You know, I think you hear that when you work in a place or if you're if you participate in hiring people or hire people directly, if you talk to the folks that do the research on it, it's true, right? It's quite expensive to replace somebody versus keeping them on for, for kind of the the longest duration that they can be productive for the company. Right. Yeah. We say it takes six months to a year to recoup your loss, essentially, mm -hmm. on hiring someone before they start to make anything for the company. And you find that to be true, like kind of across the board. It is, you know, I think what company and some companies did this, some companies are really smart and downsized, you know, their physical locations. So they were selling buildings right. throughout the pandemic. Those companies that did that saved money. I think other companies, you know, have tried various things. They've tried hoteling. I've seen that work uh, fairly well where, you know, you're not going to have a physical office that's quote yours. You're going to share this workspace. And so that's another good way to conserve space. I think what's not working well is companies who basically kept their existing locations in their yeah. offices and it's kind of a ghost town. And, you know, I think not only there's the physical resources waste to that, but there's also the feeling to that of if you're that one employee who's in on a Thursday and there are only two other people in, you don't have, you know, what probably drew you to be there on a Thursday is to get some of the social connection and you're not having the opportunity right. to do that. So would you lean towards advising companies to do that more structured approach that we were talking about where it's like these are the if you're out three days or if you're out two days, these are the two or three days that we are in so that we are all here for a purpose. Right. Right. This is when the big meeting is going down. This is when that that brainstorm is going right. down. This is when you're meeting with your supervisor. Yeah, I think the ideal solution is if you can have a, a smaller physical location than what you're at pre pandemic. You can have really cool hoteling. I've seen hoteling done well where, you know, you can even have photo frames that I come in for my day. I stick my flash drive in and it's got personalized pictures oh, and nice. then you come in the next. Right. So you can personalize things even to some degree, but that we were strategic about which teams are in. So Monday, Wednesday teams, you know, A through F are in and mm -hmm. then G through M are in on Tuesday, Thursday. And that's most efficient use of resources. That's making sure that the right teams are in together to have those conversations. It requires a high degree of coordination. But I think that that companies who are doing this well are doing some of those strategies. And they're probably advertising that they're doing that, too, is one of the things I've noticed um, as I'm desperately trying to stop working with Aaron and Kyle. One of the things I've noticed as my interns graduate and I'm looking at job opportunities with them is that like the the schedule and and what days are remote and things are, are they're on they're on the job listings and i my suspicion and i think you could probably answer this pretty well is that particularly young people who are starting to enter the workforce right now because of the way high school and or college has start has changed because of the pandemic and because of the way it has remained since then they're used to living their lives and getting things done partially in person and a little bit on their own time and online and I think that that translating that type of a schedule to their professional, their first professional experience is attractive to them. Yeah, absolutely. And so here's the challenge. So the challenge for, you know, I talk to students about this all the time. Remote work is really attractive, I think. So when mm. you are looking at those job postings and they have that remote availability, that sounds great. Every, who doesn't want to work in their pajamas every day, right? right? That sounds awesome. 
And some of us did that. I may have had a week or two, right, where it was yoga pants all week. Oh, dude, pajama pants during the all pandemic, the way. right? Mm-hmm, totally, mm-hmm. it was great, but not for all of us. And so there are certain, and, and I'm one of them. I'm naturally a little bit introverted, so that might be my tendency. But I might need to be a part of my team to help push myself out of that sometimes, mm-hmm. right? So I need to work on my extroversion. I need to work on my teamwork skills. The more that I hunker down in my little bunker and all of the comfy things, I'm going to step away from those things that might be that next step towards my career. And then there's one even more serious implication that I talk to students with mental health issues. And, and I, I think it's not a great option always if you have underlying depression, if you struggle with anxiety, being isolated is oftentimes not helpful for those conditions. And so, you know, I caution people to, you know, talk to your therapist about those kinds of things before you make those decisions, because your day to day, your work life is a huge part of your identity, a huge part of who you are and can very much impact your mental health as well. Yeah, I think that's really good to think about. I, anecdotally, I, I again, was a small business owner before I worked in higher ed. And by small business, I mean me and one employee. So very, very small business. And I worked from home a lot. I had an office, but I worked from home a lot. And I, I know that about midway through that journey for me before I you know, left for where I'm at now, I realized that days that I worked in my pajamas started to feel like they lasted forever, or maybe they were only five minutes long. I had to cognitively make the decision to when I get up, I'm going to get dressed and I'm going to get dressed for work, even if I work for home from home, because it is really easy to kind of just like fall into kind of this almost twilight state of work. If you don't keep a really rigid schedule for yourself, not necessarily because the company's putting it on you, you might just feel like you're never getting a break, even though you thought you're going to feel like you had a break all the time. Does, does yeah. that make sense? And that impacts your stress and well-being. Uh, and we saw that happen to lots of people in the pandemic. One of the things that was a really interesting study that came out of the pandemic is having people not just get dressed, but actually get in your car and drive around a block or two and then park back at your house, go back in and start your work day and then do the same thing at the end of your work day. Get back in your car, drive a couple of blocks. And they they found that really it did a little bit of cognitive resetting, like a switch. And so we are creatures of habit and we have our routines and our routines trigger certain chemicals in our brain that kind of signal, hey, pay attention time. It's alert time. We're going to be awake. We're going to be productive. When you're in your pajamas, those chemicals are not kicked in, right? So they did suggest, you know, that you're going to have to really work harder at setting boundaries. And I think that boundaries are really, really important now more than ever because of the ability that we have to essentially work from wherever, whenever I catch myself often at, you know, my son's basketball game and I'll be checking work emails and, Mm. you know, there's just this continual blur of, you know, there's no separation between your home life and your work life anymore. And that can take a toll on mental health over time. I think it was during, I think it was first year of the pandemic. I have a, I have a friend who is a content creator and largely works from home. And her husband is a doctor. I'm pretty sure this was her I had the conversation with. Caroline, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I'm on a, misattributing this to you. But I think she had mentioned something about like, as wild as what he was going through was, like there was like a reset when you get to, when you drive to and from the hospital where yes. you're like, work? Not, nah. but when you're kind of sitting in the doldrum of something that's obviously even much less stressful than that, like it, you just feel like you're at work all the time. Like it just feels like you're like, you're at work all the time. And I I know I've heard other people talk about like making you sure you have a home office, even if it's just buying like a changing screen and putting around like a card table in your kitchen. If you don't have a lot of space, like you should still have a place that you work and a place that you live. Mm -hmm. Even if the place that you work is as big as this table that we're at, don't do anything else at that table. Leave your work there, leave the laptop there. and, And that's where you get it done. So if you even if it's the middle of the night and you're like, I have to go do X, get up, Go turn the light on and go do it at that space. Um, Yeah, same thing that they tell us about sleep hygiene, right? It's your bed should only be for no devices in bed. Never bring a device. I'm so bad at that. So here's a great, I'm glad you just said that. I am, I'm really bad at it. Here's a fun exercise. If Mm. you ever want to test your separation of your home and work life boundaries, delete your email app from your phone. (gasps) Yes, (laughs) it's wild. I did this during the pandemic. I'm so sad to say that I've put it back since, but. It was really 
really eye-opening because if you have to sit at your computer to do emails, Mm -hmm. it completely changes the way that you email it. Sometimes the way that you respond, the tone and how, you know, we're really fast to respond to things that sometimes maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should sit and think on a bit when it's on our phone. But you will also, it's just truly shocking that first week or two, how often you go to touch. (laughs) I would touch it and I'd be like, it's not here. What happened? And then, oh yeah, I forgot. I deleted that. I believe in that advice that you gave just that, that I believe in that so much. I do not know that I could do it. Well. It's a great actually, even if you just do it for a day, yeah. just to test yourself and see how many times do you try to multitask. Yeah. Because multitasking, we found, is not mm. productive. We are actually less productive. Oh, we yeah. waste efficiency and we make more mistakes and it's bad for our brain, all of the things. So yeah, I, I live off of adult ADD, so I really do. I believe everything you're saying. My best days are when I write a list. And if I write the list, I'm m- much more efficient if I just only get the list done in the order in which I wrote it, unless mm-hmm. someone comes in and is like, hey, do this now. This is probably the case, too. I, f- I feel like I'm a recovering workaholic and I have been for like a decade. Maybe less than that, maybe six years, seven years. I hear that stuff. And I'm like I said, I I. I want to embody that sort of an idea and then i'm like but i won't <laughs> like i'm i'm never gonna delete outlook for my phone yeah so you said you have your outlook back in your phone do you guys have outlook on your phone yeah i have outlook but i don't have teams notifications oh, that's well a good and, one. and step one so if you like <laughs> like you're in recovery right and there's steps and so if step one is just as simple as I turn off my notifications. That's a good thing. So, I do do that one actually. That's good. I do. Yeah. So so that so you're already you're already <laughs> like in the phases. But you know, we are in America. We are workaholics, and we yeah. very much have a strong Monday through Friday eight to five culture. And then you're also twenty four seven responding, and you know, technology has made that possible. Right. But I, but it's we've also made it challenging. I think socially we've. It, it, part of it's the pandemic. I think part of it's there's there's like a renewed interest in labor right now in the country. There's all sorts of just weird kind of paradigm shifts that are happening where it does feel like there's a little bit less of a slow clap for you, like working yourself to death. I, I joke with yes. my employees, and my interns about this all the time that I've been there. I can remember, you know, hitting a wall before I shut down that business of mine and, and went into my higher ed. I joke that all the time. Higher ed for me, soft retirement. At least it feels like it because I was working so much. And one of the reasons that you work so much is that there's all of these people around you going. Mm -hmm. They see what you're doing and they go, good job. It doesn't matter if it's even to the level that it's destructive. Folks are kind of like, yeah, working hard is the number one virtue. It makes you an ethical and good person. And they just clap you all the way until you crack. Yes, but can I give you a yes, but? 100% you can give me a yes, So I had a colleague that I worked with once upon a time who was there before everyone, there after everyone. Mm-hmm. And that was very much, he was going to advance his career by doing that. He, I had an office near him and would hear him, you know, talking to the car dealers on the phone mm-hmm. and talking to his wife and, you know, doing clearly non-work activities while he was physically at the office. Right. I'll just, long story short, his magical story that he had that was going to work out didn't work out for him. Yeah. You know, and I'm a big believer in work smarter, not harder. And so if you can get in and get your work done, it's not about physically being there. And I think Mm -hmm. to this remote work, you know, it's about being strategically there at the right times with the right people, putting yourself there when somebody's there to know that you're there to have that conversation. You're there to have access to a mentorship opportunity. You're there to have these crucial moments but it doesn't have to be all consuming. And, and I think that we're also, there was a cost to the pandemic that everyone paid. And I think we're still calculating that cost. Yeah, I think so. Too. And I think that it impacted everyone's mental health. And so we now are having to be smart about prioritizing our personal lives. And if you don't make yourself a priority, then mm-hmm. you're going to, you're going to pay the effects. And I think that some of us have paid that and have felt that. And so now we understand a little bit more the value of I need to make time for me and understanding what that might look like. So I'm starting to see that attaboy culture a mm-hmm. little bit pushed back of, you know, you really need to be here for this. Hey, yeah. you know, can you maybe work remotely on Friday? I noticed we didn't have any meetings. And, and I think the more that we as a culture kind of shape that, that that's going to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully get us to a, a more balanced work 
And, and you can absolutely do that while still raising expectations and adjusting goals. I mean, I feel like I feel like we do that here all the time. Absolutely. I know that I know the team that I work with is doing a lot more this year and we'll do a lot more next year than we did three years ago. And it and it's not because everyone's working 70 hours a week mm -hmm. at all. I mean, there, there's a lot of check ins. You know, I know I check in on my team. I know that my director will physically ask me, taking care of yourself, taking any time mm -hmm. like like she'll be on my case about that because she doesn't want me to fall into that kind of proclivity that I used to have where it's like, eh, just mm -hmm. you can fix this with extra hours. You can't fix everything with extra hours, like you said. And, and that perception was probably a little dangerous even for that old, old colleague that you had where it's like, I mean, you're kind of just existing here to impress people now, right? I mean, I'll yeah. just take care of it from here in case you guys need me is probably what he was hoping that would look like, right? Right. Well, and I think the thing too is that people assume that we make all these assumptions, right? So I assume that you know why I choose to work the way that I am or why I might come in early or why I might stay late or why I might not be here at all on a Friday. Mm. But probably we never had that conversation and I never explicitly said. And so I think employees need to be aware that you need to explicitly state what are your reasons for wanting to be remote? Mm -hmm. I got great advice and mentorship once um, when I was asking a female president of university, actually, how she navigates her personal life and all of her duties. And, and, and I was speaking specifically to caregiving, having children myself. Like mm -hmm. There are times when I felt like I can't bring up children into this conversation because I don't want to be labeled as that person who has those other duties, who's not going to be fully committed to work. The advice was great. And she said, you frame it all in how, what, you know, you frame it all in terms of what you need to be your most successful self, your mm -hmm. most productive self. And I think that we can all relate to that, that you've had those days where you've pushed through something hard, you come to work exhausted, you're just kind of checking the boxes that day, you go home and you were a zombie and you didn't, you know, contribute a lot, you weren't your best self, yeah. right? And then you've had those days coming off of a vacation or coming off of a personal day, or you took time to do X, Y, or Z that you really wanted to. And then you came in fresh and you had a much more productive day. You contributed novel ideas. Um, and, and so it's about making that case for, you know, and it's very individual, right? Because we all have different caregiving responsibilities, different personal, you know, identities, um, conditions and things that might change the way that we work. But, you know, asking yourself, what does that look like for me in terms of doing my best work and then have that conversation with your employer? With all with all of this stuff being considered, if you had to if you had to hazard a guess, what, what are we looking at in the next 10 years? Like if you could be sooth soothsayer for us a little bit in the professional space, what, what are our schedules going to look like? How are we going to be working? What are those big changes that are coming? Sure. Well, I think that one of the potential big disruptors that's coming our way is AI. And mm -hmm. we haven't talked about that yet. But uh, that's kind of this unknown. And, and when AI was first evolving, the first the assumption was, well, it's going to take all of the entry level jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's going to be the case anywhere. We're starting to yeah. find out like it's going to take some lawyers jobs and it's going to take some accountants and it's going to do some things that, that are at a higher level skill set. And so we're also going to have people using those tools more, which can be done flexibly and remotely. So I think that as workers, we're moving towards adapting our competencies and our skills in terms of being able to solve problems, being able to communicate and collaborate and do very people-oriented types of skills that AI is not going to be able to do as well. And so, you know, we, when I think about that five-day-a-week kind of traditional notion, is that going to be totally gone? I think for most companies, it is. I think that you'll have, because of really strong, long-standing cultures, there will be certain companies and certain industries that might be harder uh, to let go of that. But I think that what you're going to find is, and that's where we are now, really, there's a war for talent. It's a very competitive market space right now. And so if you want to get top talent, you need to be able to recruit people. And that means meeting their needs. And People have realized the value of having some personal time, having some flexibility to meet needs. We're also realizing the value of having diverse individuals at work. And that means that not everyone's lifestyles are built in such a way that I can go work from eight to five, Monday through Friday. I might have caregiving needs that impact me. And so we, the more that we're able to be flexible and adaptable around that, we'll have a more diverse workforce. We'll be able to 
bring more talent into our organizations. So the more that companies lean into this, I think ultimately the more successful that they're going to be. But I, I think it's going to be uh, a continual evolution. And I don't think we're going to settle. I, I don't think we'll find one new, we've got the, you know, three, two, two, or the, the you know, mm. four or alternating Fridays is going to be the most popular. I, I think you're going to see a lot of different models out there. And which means that there's a lot of choice for employers, uh, you know, and if you're on the job market that you have a lot of options. And so asking those questions about those practices is really important when you're on that job interview. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing you again in person. Great. Awesome, Misty. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for telling me about remote work. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by the search bar. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you never have to search for another episode.